Before you get your first industry programming job, there's no easy way for you to know how much of what you learn in school you actually have to know and how much of it is just filler for a general education. In this video, I'm going to go over the skills and the education that I think is relevant to your first couple years as an industry programmer. Note that just knowing these things isn't going to necessarily get you a job. Hi, I'm John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. Over the last 40 years, I've worked and gone to school at a variety of places, including Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Oracle. I've been to several universities, both working there and uh, going to school there. What I have here is a collection of the things that I've learned from going through starting up as a programmer myself and helping mentor and observing hundreds of other programmers who are first starting out in their job. So today I'm going to give you some of the tips that will help you understand what you need to learn. Even if you don't want to go to school, these things will at least give you the skills to succeed when you start your first job. First, let's get a few questions out of the way. Do you need all of the information that's taught in computer science courses for a computer science degree in order to succeed as an industry programmer? No, absolutely not. In fact, I would say that there's probably two courses worth of information that you learn in school that you wind up using on the job, at least for most people. There will be specialized information you can get from some of the courses that can wind up being useful to some folks, but it's not required for you to be able to work in a particular area. So do you need to take a networking course in order to be able to work in networking, or a systems course to be able to work as a systems programmer, or an HTTP course in order to be able to work as a front-end developer? The answer for all of these is no. The courses may have some interesting information for you, but by and large, the skills that are relevant for the job you do, you'll pick up on the job. What about algorithms course and all the algorithms you learn in there? Do you have to have them all memorized and be able to produce them off the, the top of your head? The answer to this is again, no, you absolutely don't need to. You need to know that some of them exist like B trees and heaps, stacks, queues, all these sorts of things, but you don't have to be able to produce them off the top of your head. It's enough to know that they exist. Do you need to know advanced mathematics such as calculus, differential equations, and so on? The answer to this is a resounding no for almost every programming job. I've had a relatively math heavy existence and the hardest math that I've had to use other than a little trigonometry is linear algebra, which is to say working with matrices and perhaps a, a little bit of algebra. I've mentioned in many other videos that you need to go to school to have the best chance of getting a job in big tech. So if you're going to school anyways, what sort of classes will be useful? Some of the answers might surprise you. My top recommendation isn't even a computer class. Instead, it's technical writing. This is a class that teaches you style that makes technical prose and technical documentation easier to read. It gives you guidance on how to go about writing it, and it really pays dividends for your entire career. If you don't feel like taking a college course on technical writing, you can get away with just looking at the syllabus for a college course, picking up the textbook that it talks about, and then reading that textbook and doing the sections that the course is going to cover. Another useful course is the first computer science course. Now, you may already be a programmer. I was when I took that course. In fact, I'd been programming for several years and made many large programs doing interesting things. But the Intro to Programming course gives you information about how to program and it exposes you to using certain algorithms that are only theory until then. Also, a lot of the projects, at least that I had, were things that took 40 or 80 hours and had relatively tight deadlines. That is very valuable experience for being able to excel at a career. Introduction to Algorithms was another useful course. Now, I mentioned earlier, you don't have to know all the algorithms they present, but still, being exposed to them tells you the name of them, it tells you what they're good for, and some of the relevant characteristics of those algorithms. So when you have to solve a problem, you can remember what the relevant things are to look up, go and look them up on the web or in a book, whatever works for you. And that, in turn, will help you provide a better solution for any programming problem you're working on. The last course that I personally found useful is one that will be useful to people who have to work a lot with graphs or matrices, finding things like shortest path or proving whether a path exists, working with graph databases and so on. That class is discrete mathematics. This is a branch of mathematics that's really more related to graph theory, you know, easy graph theory, and to algebra. But it introduces you to many algorithms that people were using in the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s that are still useful today. For example, let's say you have a street plan. How do you figure out a path to traverse all those streets with the shortest possible distance traveled? And I'm afraid that's it in terms of practical use classes. All the rest of the classes, like I said earlier, they can be interesting, 
They can teach you things, uh, the existence of various fields, but in terms of actually making you an expert for a part of the work you're going to be doing, they don't tend to help very much for that. And that covers the schoolwork side of things. Now let's talk a bit about some of the practical skills that I think everybody should have, and in particular, types of tools and so on that they should know how to use. First is integrated development environments. If you're a professional developer, chances are this is where you spend almost all of your time when you're coding or working on code or reviewing code. My favorite environment is Visual Studio, uh, both Visual Studio Code and the Visual Studio you buy. Visual Studio supports a variety of languages, including web development languages, C++, C Sharp, F Sharp, and so on. It provides an integrated environment for access to source control, to debugging, to reviewing and making uh, changes to files and change lists, and all kinds of things. It's absolutely a great development environment. My second favorite development environment is IntelliJ IDEA from JetBrains. This development environment is mostly for Java, but it's got just amazing integration with uh, Java and with all the information there, and I really like the environment itself. So if you're working in Java, especially if you're on a platform where you can't use Visual Studio easily, I'd recommend working with uh, IntelliJ IDEA. Finally, if neither of those meets your needs, then the environment I tend to go to first is Eclipse. This is an open source editor and uh, IDE that has integration with a large number of languages, a large number of tools. It's got some great tools that are uh, developed on top of it. And you can't go wrong using it, although it's a little more complicated to learn than the other two environments. The great thing about learning any of these IDEs is it does have a little bit of a cost up front, but then you can use that IDE for the rest of your career. The first time I used IntelliJ ID was over 10 years ago. The first time I used Visual Studio was more than 20 years ago. I still use both of those today. Another tool set you want to be very familiar with is a linking and a compilation environment. You want to be able to make make files that will link together a bunch of sources. You want to be able to reference and include libraries. You want to be able to make your own libraries that can be included both by your programs and by other people. The ability to use code that already exists, both things you've written before and things that are available in uh, open source, is going to be invaluable for you for your entire career. You've heard me talk about source control a few times. This is a tool that allows you to save copies of any sort of program source and be able to retrieve that at a later date to make speculative changes and decide whether to include them in the copy that everybody sees or whether to have it available only when people ask for it. The most common source control tool that I know of today is called Git. That's a great one to learn. Plus, if you know Git, you probably also know GitHub, which is probably the biggest repository for open source on the web. Knowing how to access the GitHub repository means you'll be able to take a look at, learn from, and benefit from all the open source work that people are doing. For example, I was able to see the implementation of a C Sharp compiler there and of a couple different Java environments. It's great to be able to look at the source for things you're not quite sure how they work. Another critical skill is knowing how to debug. This is something that you absolutely will need to do if you're working as a professional programmer. The most common way to debug, and one of the easiest, is actually just instrumenting your code. For example, putting in print statements that print out the value of a variable and whether or not a particular part of code is reached. You'd be amazed how many problems this can solve. In addition to that normal way of uh, just printing out the information, there's specialized environments called trace libraries or also logging libraries that let you choose which modules to output the text from and how verbose that output is, which can, again, make it much easier for you to reconstruct what happened when some sort of problem was encountered. The second common way to debug code is to run it underneath a debugger or inside of your IDE. You actually load the environment locally, start running the program, and then reproduce a problem that you have. You need to know how to load the code, how to execute it, set breakpoints, set things called watch points, which are sort of conditional breakpoints, and all sorts of things like that. Knowing all of this will pay huge dividends throughout your career. And finally, a rare debugging skill, but one that's absolutely worth developing, is learning how to debug remotely. For example, let's say that you have a uh, an OS running on the cloud, and you've got a program running on that OS. You want to debug it, but you don't want to have to remote desktop into that cloud instance. One thing you can do is load the IDE on your local machine, and then connect up and do remote debugging of that remote executable. It lets you see things where problems are happening, rather than trying to reproduce it on your local machine, which in some cases may just be impossible. 
So if you can put in the work to learn how to do remote debugging, you're going to be very happy with that ability. You want to make sure that you're familiar with the sorts of environments that are used to produce programmer documentation. This includes things like wiki pages as well as standard tools like Google Docs or Word, uh, things like that. You also want to be familiar with producing the different sorts of documentation that's required, vision specs, one pagers, design specs, architecture specs, test specs, implementation specs. If you're not familiar with all these names, it's worth spending some time looking and seeing what's involved in those at the various companies that you might want to work at. Most programmers work in teams. Even if they're producing something that'll be standalone, they still work with other members of their local team to get their code reviewed, to get suggestions on things that should change. So make sure that you know how to use code review tools. These tools allow you to take a look at just the changes somebody made, to understand them in context, and then to leave comments or questions in that. Then when they come back to change their code, they, uh, the uploaded changes actually show up in that tool and sometimes an annotation explaining what they did. It's a really valuable way to make sure that the changes that you suggest are being at least considered and whether or not they're implemented. And finally, you want to be good at making testable code and implementing unit tests and integration tests to ensure that the code is working the way that you need it to. Some of the common tools for doing this are Makito, mocking tools, also uh, JUnit and other unit test frameworks. There's a great one in Visual Studio. Learning one of those frameworks, understanding how it works, will do two things. It will make it easier for you to know how to write testable code and to test it, and it'll make it easier for you to learn a different testing or mocking framework if you should need one for a different language that you wind up working in. It's absolutely a requirement these days for code that you write to have some sort of test. That test protects you from yourself, and it also protects your code from people who need to modify it who don't necessarily understand how everything fits together. Some additional things that you should be familiar with as a programmer. First, understanding the terminology, being able to use the right terminology to describe a problem or a solution is absolutely critical. There's a sort of litmus test when you're talking to other developers where if you don't know the right thing to call common, common concepts, it tends to make the rest of the things you suggest suspect. Also, if you don't know the right terminology, it can make it very difficult for you to find what you're looking for. Which brings us to the next suggestion getting very good at Googling. You want to be very good at finding the answers to questions that you have, using Google to look up a discussion that people have had about which algorithm to choose, about the best way to implement an algorithm, and so on. This links back to understanding the names of algorithms and the names of concept and terminology. If you don't know what something's called, it's awfully hard to look for it and be able to use it. One tip to help with your Googling is to use the site colon keyword. This is a way of limiting the results of a Google, Google query to a particular website. For example, you can say site colon stackoverflow.com and it will only return results for your query from stock, Stack Overflow, which is very valuable. Not Stack Overflow, that's for shopping. You need to understand the difference between intrinsic keywords and classes and interfaces in a given language. You want to know that language very well so that you're able to use it effectively. Now, understanding also the intrinsic data types versus the uh, more general class data types is important for having performant code and for knowing what fits together how and how much data you can put in before things start to overflow. As long as we're talking about language, you also need to understand how to declare functions, how to declare uh, the different parameters that can go into them, the types of those parameters, a default value if there is one, and what gets returned by the functions. You want to have a very good grip on operators, and that means Boolean operators, logical operators, arithmetic operators, and ternary operators, to name just a few. You want to understand the precedence rules for these. In other words, if you don't use any sort of uh, parentheses around it, what order are the different operations in the line executed in? Uh, what I've personally found is both knowing that and using lots of parentheses winds up saving a lot of trouble later. You want to know how to use the core types that are in your language. For example, array sets, lists, um, hash sets, hash tables, and so on. These are all basic class types that people are just expected to know how to use, and you should understand exactly how they work. One of the more complicated concepts in programming today, but something you absolutely have to understand, is asynchrony and multi-threading. Uh, lots of the processors today have multiple different cores on them. Those cores can be doing different things at the same time. 
and programming languages are designed to take advantage of that. What this means is that you as a programmer have to understand how to have multiple things going on at once, how to synchronize their behavior, and how to have variables or values that are shared among them. So you want to understand threads, processes, in some cases bundles. You want to know about synchronization constructs such as lock, semaphores, mutexes, critical sections, and even interlocked APIs such as interlocked increment and interlocked decrement that provide atomic updates to variables. And that's the fundamentals, at least from my perspective. If all the information that I presented in this video is stuff that you're familiar with, that you've done, that you know how to find out about, then you're probably in pretty good shape for being able to start an industry job. Now, the next thing you have to do if you're not already in big tech is find a job, and that's a lot more difficult. Fortunately, myself and other people like me have put a lot of advice onto YouTube. So if you feel like it, take a look at some of my career or finding a job uh, videos, and hopefully it'll be useful to you. Thanks again for taking the time to watch, and keep on pushing forward.